welcome. It's glad to see you today in the house of the Lord. If you guys want to, sorry, if you want to stand, we're going to sing today. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one let your kingdom come father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day our daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us forgive them and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one let your kingdom come it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. We thank you that we could come together. We thank you that we could be here, and we thank you that we can worship. I pray that you're honored by everything that takes place. I pray that you would be with us, that you would be in our midst, and we pray that we bring you glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. We know if you have a few things that we need to let you know. You guys can go ahead and sit down today. We have a few, a little bit of business to conduct today. Um, I do have a few things to let you know about. First, today, immediately following service, we have our all-committee meeting. So our all-committee meeting takes place today, and um, so immediately after this, we will go and we will have lunch together, and um, then we'll move into our meeting part. So if you are on a committee, you should know that you're on the committee. The list of who is coming to this meeting went around to the Sunday school classes, and so that is today, immediately following service. Um, Wednesday night, we had our first kickoff of our Daniel Bible study. We had a great night. Lots of folks there. We'd love to have you this Wednesday night as we move into Daniel chapter 2. Now, I want to talk to you about what's going on coming up. September the 8th, we kick off our new semester of Sunday night Bible studies. So lots of stuff going on uh, coming up September 8th. So some things are going to work a little differently this semester, so I just want to take just a few minutes and spell out some of the changes that we're making so that you know what's going on, how to prepare, and then you're going to get to hear from those who are teaching Bible studies during this semester. So first thing is, one of the first things that's going to change is we're going to start on September 8th. We'll have three weeks of our regularly scheduled programming, and I'll talk to you about what the regular schedule is in just a minute. But on the last Sunday of every month, we're going to try something different. What we're going to try is on the last Sunday of every month, we're going to have an after 
morning church potluck. We did this over the summer. Everybody seemed to really enjoy it. So the last Sunday of the month, we'll have a potluck all together. And then there will be no Sunday night activities that night. So it'll be three weeks on, one week off, three weeks on. So that means three potlucks uh, this first semester. And so that starts September the 8th. We'll have our first of three weeks of our Sunday night discipleship. And then we'll have our after church potluck on the last Sunday of the month. We'll keep you up to date on what's going on week to week, okay? Um, and so the other thing is, on our, on our, our we're going to slightly change our schedule on Sunday nights. Our meals will still start at 5. 30. At 5.30, we will have our family meal, and there are already sign-up sheets for the first three family meals out back there at the table. However, what we're going to do is we're going to start Awana and our kids' ministry at 6 o'clock. So at 6 o'clock, the kids are going to leave. We'll ring a bell. The kids are going to leave. Anybody that's been here knows the kids are done by 6 o'clock anyway, right? And so the kids are going to go and they're going to start Awana and they'll start youth group and all of that kind of stuff. The adult Bible studies will start at 6.15. What that allows for is that allows for our adults from 6 o'clock to 6.15 to help clean up. It helps us put the tables away. It helps us get all the trash picked up and all of that stuff. So adults can help for 15 minutes in cleanup before going to their Bible studies, which will start at 615. So the first group that we have is Awana will meet from 6 to 730. That's pre-K through fourth grade. Now you'll notice that that's a slightly different change of the age. And so Awana will go through fourth grade. That's because we're introducing a new group called junior youth that is for fifth and sixth graders that will meet at that same time. And so they'll meet at that same time, but this is a special group just for fifth and sixth graders. And we're introducing that this semester. Then at the same time, the youth Youth group will meet and youth will meet 7th through 12th grade. They'll meet in the youth room during that same time. So we'll have something for all of those different ages. There will be something special for all of those different ages during that time. And now I want to tell you about we're offering four different adult Bible studies. And so here's our schedule, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.15. But we're offering four different adult Bible studies. Um, and so the first one up is when you pray. And now Robin Keel is not here this morning, and so I'll tell you a little about that. Robin Keel is facilitating this group, how you pray, how to pray when you're alone and when you're gathered with others. It's a study on how to pray. Now what's different about this group is that they will meet at Rome Meadows at the community room. This is something different we're trying. And so this group will meet up there and will be facilitated by Robin Keel. Now all four of these Bible studies have sign-up sheets in the back. And so um, they're there. So if my other three teachers want to head down here and as yours comes up, give an introduction to your class, I'd appreciate it. So come on down, those of you that are teaching. Next, Jennifer's the closest. Hers is up next, the Gospel of John. Oh, yeah. It's Good morning. I will be uh, facilitating... Um, the study of the Gospel of John by Melissa Spolstra, and it is going to be savoring the peace of Jesus in a chaotic world. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good for me. <laughs> a chaotic world is certainly what we live in these days. This will be a seven-week study on the Gospel of John. Melissa will encourage us to slow down and linger with the living word. We'll begin to appreciate the pace of the Savior who never hurried, but completed all that the Father had accomplished, uh, had called him to accomplish. So as we go through this study, we'll begin to understand that the peace of, that Jesus offers is not an ease of circumstances, but a stillness of the soul. Fun fact about this Bible study, three of us, Rachel and Amanda and I, sat in on the taping of this um, Bible study a year ago in June um, when Lifeway was, was producing this. So kind of a fun thing. You might see some smiling faces you recognize if you come and sit in on the study with us. Thanks. Okay, you go. Yeah, let everybody see you. You know, Jason told me that we were going to do this last week, and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what we're doing is, uh, is how many want to know what heaven is like? So the study is by Chip Ingram, and it's in Right News Media. We did it in my class up there a while back, and it was a hit. So uh, if you want to know what heaven's going to be like before you get there, come to my class. And I think it's six sessions. We're going to reference Chip Ingram's study, and we're also going to reference a little bit of Randy Alcorn's book at the same time. 
So we get all your questions asked uh, are filled in before you get to heaven. And it answers questions like everybody answers. You want to know, are you going to still be married in heaven? How old are you going to be in heaven? And, uh, and there will be airplanes in heaven, right? <laughs> yes. So, but anyway, uh, hope to see you there. Thank you. Morning, guys. Mine doesn't look that spectacular, but what's it mean to be a better man? If you ask 100 people out there today what does it mean to be a man, you're going to get 100 different answers. That's because two generations ago, men were confident in their manhood. One generation ago, men began to compromise their manhood, and today men are confused about their manhood. They said, we live in a time when a common definition or, or vision for manhood does not exist. Robert Lewis stated that you cannot become what you cannot define. And so this world is constantly changing the definition of a manhood. Jim McNamara, head of the research company from England, had his team conduct a six-week study of mass media, which included news outlets and talk shows. And every time a man was mentioned, a note was made. It was discovered that here in the United States, in the United States, 80% of the time when a man was mentioned, he was cast in one of four categories. A villain, aggressor, pervert, or a womanizer. And so this is what men are hearing from our culture and is leading to a culture of confused men. And so this confusion is leading to despair. In the 1970s, it was, I don't need a man. In the 1990s, it was, I don't want a man. And in 2024, is what is a man? And so in the 1940s, men faked their age to fight in World War II. And in 2024, men are pretending to be women to win in sports. And so it, it, it's, it's a study. And so this study is a wake-up call. It's a men are to be defined by, not by the culture, but by the word of God. And so life-giving is the word that the Bible uses to describe the manhood of Jesus. And so we're going to take a good hard look at what the Bible says it is to be a real man. A real man courageously follows God's word. A real man loves and protects God's woman. A real man excels at God's work. And then a real man betters God's world. And so the end goal of this is to be Christ-likeness in that the man no longer sees himself as a drain on the world, but like Christ, a gift to the world to better those around him. And so, men, we need this. As a culture, we need this. We need to get back to the biblical definition of what a man is. And so that's what we're going to be looking into, diving into. Um, they said the best way to do these is to have a meeting place. We have the church to provide a meal. Meals provided at 530. Come for that. And then we're going to watch some videos and to ask some hard questions and to get back to what it means to being a man in this world. So come join us and be blessed. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to do that. Just to let you know, um, Jennifer's class will be for women, Ryan's class will be for men, and uh, Robin and Ryan, Robin and Dan's classes will be for anyone that would like to attend. And so all, there are sign-up sheets for all four of these back there on the table. If you would please sign up for one of those classes. Signing up helps us to know which classrooms we need to put which class in, depending upon uh, how many are in each class. So sign-up sheets are back there for the classes, sign-up sheets are back there for the meals, and all of that that's coming up. If you want to help in Awana, we still have places. We still have places uh, all over the place. And so if you want to help, we'd love to have you um, wherever God is calling you to be. But what I encourage you is to be a part of what's coming up on September 8th. Uh, Sunday night discipleship is a really special time. I think you're really going to enjoy it and appreciate being a part. So we really look forward to that. Um, I think that's all the announcements that I have for you right now. And so we're going to get back to worship. Why don't we stand together and pray together? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for teachers who are willing to teach, and I thank you for people who are teachable. Lord, I pray that you would just be with us and that you would tell us where we need to be, where you want each of us to be, and what class you want us to be in, where you want us to be serving, what you want us to be doing. Lord, I thank you for all of the people that have already volunteered and that are filling spots that are making these Sunday nights possible. Lord, we thank you for all that's going on, and we praise you, and we, we want to follow you in everything we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Sing the 
dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high. dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high
do if they all disappear? Riches and fame and all that they could buy I've come to find they never satisfy What would I gain if my soul's a prize? I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world does I only want you I only want you First things first To seek your will Not my own Surrender all my wants to you Keep the first thing first To live your truth Walk your way Lord, I fix my face on you. All my desires reversed to keep the first thing first. I give it all, my life and offering. My heart is yours, so have your way in me. Your kingdom's all I want to see. I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world does I only want you I only want you First things first to seek your will Not my own Surrender all my wants to you Keep the first thing first to live your truth, walk your ways, set my eyes, Lord, I fix my face on you. All my desires reversed to keep the first thing first. To keep the first thing first. All my desires reversed. what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world does I only want you I only want you
soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I So, Father, we offer that willingly, lovingly, with all that we have in us this morning, Father. A hallelujah to you, our King, our Savior. Father, just be with us. Open our hearts to continue to worship you through the word. Open our hearts to receive it this morning, to hear you speaking to us with Pastor Jason as he brings that word to us. And Father, if there is anyone here that does not know you as Savior this morning, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Father, for those that have needs, Father, we just pray that that those would be made known and that we can pray over those this morning. Father, we love you and we give you our hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. God's Word is the inspired Word of God. The words that we have in the Bible are from God. I absolutely believe that. At the same time, when I'm reading the Bible, I can't help but think sometimes if the person who was writing it said, God, are you you sure you want me to write it that way? When we were studying the book of Exodus, Moses was writing about himself, and it goes a little like this. Moses, the baby, who was the cutest baby you ever did see, grew up to be a very handsome man, good-looking. Then in the New Testament, we read John, who feels it's important that we know about the foot race to the tomb, and not just the foot race to the tomb, but who won and who lost. John, who humbly calls himself the beloved disciple, is the one that won. Forever it will be that way in Scripture. Just this week we studied Daniel on Wednesday night, and if you were there, you know Daniel describes himself as a young man without defect. And so I can't help but think of these guys where they're hearing from the Lord, this is what I'm supposed to write, this is how I'm supposed to write it. Are you sure? You want me to describe myself that way? Okay, I'll do that. Now Nehemiah, he doesn't describe himself that way. Nehemiah doesn't actually comment at all on his looks. But what Nehemiah does do that he does really well is he does good at giving God the glory. He doesn't make much of himself. He makes much of God. He gives God all of the glory. And today we're going to see Nehemiah speak to the king and what transpires when he does that. And throughout this, we're going to see that over and over again, he gives the glory to God, taking the focus off of himself and putting it where it belongs. 
The humility displayed by this man of God is something that we could all certainly learn from. Last week in Nehemiah chapter 1, we saw Nehemiah receive the news that the city of Jerusalem was in disarray, that the walls were torn down, that the gates had been burned. If you remember, we talked about how he stopped, he wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed. We even got to hear his prayer and see his heart. Last week, I challenged us that we should be people that don't just have a knee-jerk reaction, but we have a moment to stop, to, to, to pause before doing what God has asked us to do. And unfortunately, we tend to fall into one of two camps. One camp is that we're going to jump in and fix the problem. I'm just going to go, I'm just going to go and I'm going to fix it, Right? The other camp, which is equally dangerous, is we'll just pray about that. Let's just gather around and we'll pray about it and never do anything about it. We just pray and never act. I heard a joke this week, and it was about Baptists. And it said, how many Baptists does it take to change a light bulb? I like to do this thing where I actually try and figure the end of the joke out and see if, if my answer to the joke is better than theirs. So I said, my answer to the joke was, change? <laughs> right? That's a good one. That's a good one, right? But their answer was, we don't know the committee is still meeting on that one. And, oh, I thought mine was funny, but then theirs was, oh, you know. It went on, and it had several different denominations, and I didn't get their jokes. So, (laughs) because I've always been Baptist. But, as I thought about that joke in light of what we're talking about today, I think we can be guilty of that. We form a committee to talk about what we're going to do, and that committee meets, and that committee meets, and that committee meets, and there's never actually any action. But we can't be people of overreaction, but we also can't be people of inaction. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and see that Nehemiah was neither of these things. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1 says, During the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was set before him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, why do you look so sad when you aren't sick? This is nothing but sadness of my, but sadness of heart. I was overwhelmed with fear and replied to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I not be sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king asked me, what is your request? So I prayed to the God of the heavens. We hear again during the month of Nisan. That doesn't mean much to us because we don't keep track of the calendar of what month it is and where it is. But this gives us a timeline. And what this tells us is that it's actually been around four months since Nehemiah received the news that Jerusalem was in, was in disarray. But what's he been doing this whole time? He's been praying, we know that. We know he's been weeping and fasting and praying, but it's been four months when suddenly he appears before the king and the king notices that he is sad. And he says, I've never been sad in the presence of the king. Do you think he had never been sad in the presence of the king? Never? Not one bad day? Or is what he's saying that he had never let his sadness show in the presence of the king. Because I think a lot of us are really good at putting on a happy face, right? When we teach people to speak English, we teach them to say, how are you doing? I am fine, and how are you? If you ever encounter someone who has learned English as a second language, that's how they'll respond. I am fine, and how are you? But that's... That's a greeting, but that's not really how we are, is it? But that's the face that we put on for the world. How are you doing today? Doing great. Are you? 
or are you just putting a face on for the world? Because I feel like Nehemiah was putting a face on for the king. He had known for four months. We saw what happened. He had been sad. He had been weeping. But finally, he allows his sadness to be seen. It's finally gotten to him, and the king knows that something is wrong. And Nehemiah shares that the city of his ancestors lies in ruins. And he praises the king. May you live forever. He's a powerful king. He's about to share his heart with the king. We know from the book of Esther that saying things to the king that are out of the norm are dangerous things to do, right? Do you realize this is the same king? Compare. Look, Artaxerxes is the king in Esther. Artaxerxes is the same king now. And so he carefully, he praises the king. The king could easily say, you're being a powder. Go to jail. Right? That could happen. Instead, the king listens to Nehemiah and asks him, what is it that he has to say? Have you ever, have you ever had a conversation with someone and you can tell there's something coming? They're telling you about the problem, but you know there's a request that is coming. The king can sense this. The king says, okay, I understand. The city's in ruins. Things are not good there. What is your request? What is it that you want to ask? Now remember, he has spent four months in prayer for this very moment. Again, he could just spit it out. He knows exactly what he wants to say. He could just say what he wants to say. But instead, what we see is, so I prayed to the God of the heavens. Even after four months of persistent prayer, in this moment, he turns to the Lord once again. He has become so in line with God's will that conversing with God has become second nature to him. When we hear the Bible instructing us to pray continuously, this is what the Bible's talking about. That we never stop having a conversation with the Lord. Nehemiah again has the opportunity to dive in and he turns to the Lord and then this is how he answers. And answer the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor with you, send me to Judah, to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I may rebuild it. The king with the queen seated beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you return? So I gave him a definite time, and it pleased the king to send me. I also said to the king, If it pleases the king, let me have letters written to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates River, so that they will grant me safe passage until I reach Judah. And let me have a letter written to Asaph, keeper of the king's forest, so that he will give me timber to rebuild the gates of the temple's fortress the city wall, and the home where I will live. The king granted my requests, for the gracious hand of my God was on me. What we see here is that Nehemiah was a man of prayer, but Nehemiah was also a man of planning. When the king asked him a question, he had an answer. He had gone for four months. If he had gone four months before, And said, the city is in ruins. And then the king said to Nehemiah, what are you asking of me? I don't know. It's bad, yeah. He spoiled the opportunity that he has. Instead, he spends this four months preparing so that he has a legitimate response. He says, allow me to go to Jerusalem so I can rebuild it. Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer, mind you. Not exactly someone who I think has the skill set necessary for rebuilding the walls of a city. Not going to be my number one choice. If I have a building project, I don't go out and find any of the local servers and say, hey, would you like to build me a house? But this man, who was a server, 
says if nobody else is going to do it, I'm going to figure it out. I'll go and I'll take care of it myself. He has a plan. This is clear when the queen speaks up. The queen, who again, if we've studied Esther, we know the queen shouldn't even be there. But she not only sits there, but she has a question and she asks, how long is this going to take? And Nehemiah shows how prepared he is by giving a concise answer with a specific timeline. He says, this is exactly how long it will take. In addition to that, I need some letters. I need letters to these governors, and I need letters to this guy who controls the timber so that I can get this done. I need these travel permissions, and I need this. Once again, this shows us that he spent these four months not just praying, but praying and preparing. Remember, we can be guilty of saying, I'll pray about it. And we fail to do any of the preparation. If you are asking the Lord to give you favor in a specific situation, as Nehemiah was doing, are you doing all that you can to prepare for God's favor? Are you taking the preparative steps? <coughs> you see, Nehemiah asked for the Lord's favor. Nehemiah prepared for the Lord's favor. And then, finally, Nehemiah recognized the Lord's favor. We see right there in verse 8. Why did the king grant Nehemiah's request? Was it because he was so prepared? Was it because of their relationship and he had done such a good job serving him? No, it was because the gracious hand of God was on Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, this all happened because of God's gracious hand. That's why all of this happened. But see, Nehemiah doesn't fall for the trap that so many of us fall for. We ask for God's favor, and we prepare for God's favor. But then when God's favor comes, we said, boy, am I lucky. We ask for God's favor, and we prepare for God's favor. And then we say, oh, wow, sure am glad I put all that hard work in. And we fail to recognize when God gives us favor but not Nehemiah. He knows that the reason all of this has just fallen into place is because of God's gracious hand upon him. So Nehemiah sets off for the promised land. In verse 9 we see, I went to the governors of the region west of the Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent officers of the infantry and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, they were greatly displeased. Nehemiah's travel to the promised land was very different than Ezra's. We walked together through the book of Ezra so you'll remember that Ezra didn't ask for any officials. Ezra had proclaimed that the Lord would keep them safe and so he was afraid to ask for officials because he thought that would undermine what he said. Nehemiah, on the other hand, travels with infantry and cavalry. So who was right and who was wrong? It doesn't have to be a matter of one being right and one being wrong. And what I'm about to say may sound crazy to some of you, but here we go. God's plan for someone else's life is going to look different than God's plan for your life, and that doesn't mean it's wrong. Let me say that again. God's plan for someone else's life is going to look different than God's plan for your life, and that doesn't mean it's wrong. Now, let's be clear about something, and I want to be clear, and that is that God does not work contrary to his word, and God's wi God will not do anything that is contrary to his word. So if someone is telling you that God has called them to do something contrary to his word, it's not God that's calling them to do that. However, God will ask us to do things that are different from one another, and that is okay. In my life, my story is that God called me to be a missionary. Then God called me to be a youth minister, and now God has called me to be a pastor. I can't expect for others to follow that exact same path. I just know that's what God has called me to do. And it's not fair for me to say someone else to someone else, if God didn't call you down this exact same road, then you're not really called. 
But I'll tell you, there are a lot of people that will tell you, if God doesn't do these things, then it's not legitimate. But you know what God is calling you to do. And I say all of this because people have said things like this to me before. And I'm sure that people have said things like this to you. Focus on the Lord and on his word and allow him to lead you, not the opinions of other people. Because even Nehemiah had opposition. Sanballat and Tobiah heard that someone had come to pursue the prosperity of the Israelites, and that displeased them. There are always going to be people who will be displeased when you seek to do what God wants you to do, pure and simple. We are just now meeting these people, but they are going to continue to be a problem. Nehemiah has arrived, but before anything gets, gets going, Nehemiah wants to stay low-key as long as he can, and so he does a little investigating. Verse 11, we're going to start with. After I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate toward the serpent's well and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but further down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I, had, where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's walls so that we will no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hand of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. And they said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to do this good work. Nehemiah isn't making any friends and he hasn't done anything yet. He doesn't want to make a splash, so he goes quietly and inspects the walls himself. He has a very specific task ahead of him, and he hasn't told any of the people yet. Nehemiah is concerned about the walls of Jerusalem. And so under the cover of night, he goes and checks out the condition for himself. Nehemiah has prayed, and Nehemiah has prepared, and all the while, all of this is going off the word of his brother who told him that the city was in shambles. He had never seen it himself, so he wants to see it for himself. He also says here that he hasn't told anyone what God has laid upon his heart. Even the plan that he has, he won't take the credit for. He's giving that glory to God as well. God is the one that laid that upon his heart. He's giving God the glory for even that. And he gathers the people around, and what does he tell them? He tells them the walls are a problem. And he also tells them how God's hand has been upon him. And Nehemiah does something that we oftentimes forget to do when there's a problem. Instead of just pointing to the problem, he also offers a solution. A problem with a solution is called problem solving. Pointing out a problem without a solution also has a name. Complaining. And that's what we tend to do. We point at a problem without a solution. But Nehemiah is showing us how to be a problem solver. This is the problem. The walls are in shambles. The solution is we fix the walls. While the Israelite people are strengthened and encouraged, not everyone in Jerusalem is. When Senballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, 
will start rebuilding, but you have no share, right, or, horse, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Trusting in God means trusting him when what you're saying is strengthening and encouraging and the people say, let's build the wall. That is following the Lord. But following the Lord also means trusting him when the people are mocking and despising you. If I can promise you one thing about the world that we live in today, if you seek to follow the Lord, if you set out to do what God asks you to do, the world is going to mock and despise you. The world that we live in is going to do that. Now, a lot of time has passed since the time of Nehemiah. But the battle that Nehemiah fights is the same battle that we fight today. To trust the Lord in the face of opposition. The names may have changed, but the battle remains the same. Will you be as bold as Nehemiah to stand in the face of opposition and proclaim God until he comes? Nehemiah asked for the Lord's favor. Nehemiah prepared for the Lord's favor. Nehemiah recognized the Lord's favor. And Nehemiah proclaimed the Lord's favor. All of us, God has asked us to do something. Maybe you're still in the asking phase. You're still in the point in which you're saying, God, will you give me favor? Maybe it's time for you to begin preparing as you continue to ask. Maybe it's time for you to say, what do I need to do before this happens? What preparation do I need to take? Maybe God's giving you favor and it's time for you to recognize it. Or maybe it's time for you to proclaim the favor that God has given you. All of us find ourselves at some point in this process. We're somewhere along this journey. And the thing is, what we'll see with Nehemiah is that even as he reaches the end, things are just going to start back over again. And that's the way it works with our God. We seek him. We ask for his favor. We go after it. We prepare. We do what God asks us to do. And then God asks us for more. When we're faithful with a little, he trusts us with a lot. So wherever you find yourselves in this whole process, give it to God today. Surrender yourself and take a step back the way that Nehemiah did. The way that he gave God the glory at every step and every turn. Allow us to step back and give him the glory. Stand together if you would and let's pray together. Dear Lord, I pray that we would give you the glory. That we wouldn't seek it for ourselves, but that we would seek to glorify and honor you at every turn. Lord, whatever stage in this process and this journey we find ourselves in, I pray that we would turn to you. You would guide us and that we would be obedient to do whatever it is you ask of us. It's in your name we pray. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, 
Lord. 